Hey, Kristen. Oh, hi, Nini. How are I'm, you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm great. Are we live right now? We are so live. Oh, it I love is it. Amazing technology. Modern, it is amazing technology. Day. And of all the nights that we've decided to go live for our very first um, Girls Rising Virtual Connect, it's the night that we have the movie makers. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You know what I mean? So there's all this pressure uh, for us to figure out how to broadcast this thing. And I just want to say, Nini, it seems you've done a stellar job because here we both are. I'll, I, I feel like the fact that we're live and we're on the screen at the same time is a win. We should just call it. I agree. Just everybody, good night. Thanks we did for it. coming. It's, it's been here. real. <laughs> uh, we did this. We got it done. And look, I, I've got a little bit of a thing behind me. Like we've we taken it up a notch. We have. Our production is really um, overwhelming. Um, so what I would like to say as we roll into this uh, live episode of Girls Rising Virtual Connect, uh, we are sponsored by Branch Real Estate Group. Wouldn't you want to share that with everyone, Nina Camps? Absolutely. Um, the 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 people over at Branch have been our main stage sponsors at our Girls Rising Music Festival for the past couple of years. And they are on board with us um, sponsoring these Girls Rising Virtual Connect since we are now living in a, I guess, a, a, what would you call it? A, a, a quarantined, mm -hmm. I don't even know what the right word is, but because of that, the Girls Rising Music Festival is postponed indefinitely, which means they won't be able to sponsor the main stage, but instead they're sponsoring these podcasts at least uh, for through the month of uh, June. So mm -hmm. thank God for them. Um, and, and with that, Girls Rising is actually, we do want to remind everyone that because we're not doing the festival, that means that is our biggest fundraiser of the year. So if you were thinking of um, donating, we would love for you to give a gift of any size to us at girlsrising.org slash donate so we can keep making these uh, these blog posts and and keep doing the work we're doing, keep the lights on at our headquarters and, um, you know, just making it possible for us to empower and inspire. Yes. Question? I, yeah, I do have, a, uh, actually, it's not a question. I wanted to say that although we have be been doing these Girls Rising Virtual Connects online, uh, we've had about eight of them already, and now we're going to start doing the live streams. We have been uh, working with schools and community centers and uh, smaller yes community groups, uh, creating Girls Rising outreaches, virtual outreaches uh, with kids um, from littles to high school to college kids and sometimes. Yeah. Um, and it's been really great. So if you are an educator, if you are someone that has a group of kids, LGBTQ, yes. we are open for business. We are really um, looking forward to connecting and please reach out to us. For that. And to piggyback on that thought. Um, we have students all the time as our guests here on the Girls Rising Virtual Connects. Um, and we've also been bringing students, older students on with us for some of the outreaches we've been doing with the schools. So if you work in the school district and you have students that you might want to recommend for us to have on as guests, that would be a fantastic thing as well, because we are predominantly um, using students from our own school district just because it's easy. Um, it's the lowest, well, also they're amazing guests, but obviously, it's easy access and we can get it, we can get them booked quickly and painlessly. But if you are in a school district anywhere else in the United States, we would love to get some students on from other states, other countries. It would be really fantastic. So um, without another word, let's not move one. on. I'm not going to say another word. That's it. You're done. I'm done for the night and you're going to take over. Great. Take it I away. I can't Nina. wait. It's my favorite part of the show. Yeah, I I want, let's go ahead, Kristen, let's go ahead and bring some of our guests on. Let's, um, let's introduce everybody, shall we? So, yeah, who's going to go first? Are you going to uh, surprise me? No, let's go ahead. Let's bring in Val, yes. our lovely, our, our right hand here at Girls Rising. Yeah, the girl who <laughs> makes it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Val Lasser. Hi, ladies. Hi, Val. Thanks for being here. Thanks so, for having me. Val Lasser is uh, a film editor at Big Sky Edit in New York City. And Val edits, I mean, all of Antigone Rising's footage for the most part. Anything that looks really good that you see coming out of Antigone Rising or Girls Rising has been edited by Val. Anything that you see that's a little bunky is probably me in iMovie, but the really good stuff is Val. Um, Val, tell everyone a little bit about what you do and, and where you're from and, and your, a little story on Val, a quick elevator pitch on who Val Lasser is. 
I am, and I will say a lot of the good quality of those videos are because we've recruited a lot of students, very talented yes. students for shooting them. But I, I'm from Glen Cove. I'm a native of Glen Cove, Long Island. Went to Glen Cove High School, been wanting to edit my whole childhood. Strange, that's a story in itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, now here I am editing at a small boutique in Manhattan for 25 years. Oh my God. Doing mostly commercials and indie films and documentaries and music videos and everything under the sun. And a lot of mentoring. I've been doing a lot yes. of mentoring over the last few years with uh, college students. Yeah. I love so that, it. that is the one thing that I will say about you, Val. Well, I mean, there's so many things I can say about Val, right? But um, <laughs> not everything. For as long as I've known you, I wouldn't say, every, I mean, I can't think of one stinky thing to say about you. There's nothing, I got nothing on you. I've known Val since we were kids. I mean, right? We were kids, we were right. young. Um, high school, middle school, high school. And um, if there's one thing I could say about Val, I've never seen anyone who has a, a more on their plate, but is able to um, hold a handout to young up and coming filmmakers. Um, um, it, like constantly. So anytime we're in need and we reach out to you, Val, you find us like three, four, five uh, young up and coming filmmakers to come and get things done. And then you edit it. I, I just, you just blow my mind at how much you can do at once. How do you do that? What do you take? That That's kind of an editor's disease, actually. A little OCD and, and, <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of combinations of things. We're always putting too much on our plate. But for instance, right now in quarantine, I'm homeschooling two kids. I'm working full time. Work has not stopped. And I decided to take a course at Yale because it was oh. free. And I'm in my seventh week. Wow. And on the science of well-being to help me manage all this. Yeah. And at the same time, nothing made me more than more happy that once the colleges went remote, I continued my internships remotely with the students at NYU that weren't finished yet. And I also wanted to just support them during this time. And there's no better distraction than education, so. I agree with that. It pleased totally. me a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, I love doing online classes. I was th actually thinking we got, it seems like they're having to rework universities um, their whole, I mean, everybody's reworking how they do things, right? So I got an email from Bucknell, which is my alma mater, saying that they were offering online classes for the summer to alumni. So you can come and take courses through Bucknell. And uh, yeah. so I was thinking about doing that. And I have done that in the past too. I took bass lessons or I took a bass course at Berkeley School of Music. Nini, question. Uh, I was wondering if maybe we should introduce our next guest. Take it away. <laughs> yeah. See, this is what happens when we're live. When yeah. we do the pre, when we do, we do the recordings, we can edit me. But we're live now, so Nini's <laughs> gonna have a real tough night, Nini. So, uh, so Val, we'll obviously come back to you, um, as um, you are such an integral part to everything Girls Rising. Uh, oh. However, um, in our own very small town of Seacliff, we have another filmmaker, um, documentarian, uh, Katie Tabor. Katie, let's take a look at you Katie. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Katie. Um, and we're so thankful to have you here this is amazing i'm thrilled it's, uh katie a fun break uh, is it is it really a fun <laughs> it break is a very fun break yeah okay good um katie tabor is a, a very good friend but also a documentarian uh and an emmy award nominated documentarian winning um, Winning. Anything. That's right. Yeah. You won. Yes. <laughs> that was a Don't you remember snap. the parade? <laughs> That's all right. That's Confetti you know. parade and see. Well, I've been to. I have actually been to a Katie <laughs> Tabor parade. Uh, not for the Emmy though, but for other reasons. You'll be there for the next one. Yes. I'm sure. Um, so, Katie, tell us a little bit about what you do, what the path was you chose, how you got to where you got, and uh, how do you end up making documentaries and some of the stuff you're doing right now. That's an interesting you know, uh, reflection, you know, I, so I am a documentary producer and a director and people often don't know what the heck a documentary producer is. Um, I often joke that it's documentary producers. Our biggest job is getting people to do things they really don't want to do. Um, open up their lives, open up, um, parts of themselves that they never intended to open up and get them to let us put that on camera. 
And, you know, in, and in documentary work, the line between producer and director is sometimes fuzzy, sometimes collaborative, it depends on sort of different, a different focus on different projects and what kind of support a project needs. Um, I got into documentaries about, well, I was close to being pregnant with my daughter. So it's basically about 15 years ago. And I had come from a theater background, both as an actress and a director and a writer. Um, and, you know, essentially storytelling and an ability to have people connect with people other than themselves was always really a passion of mine. Um, and so I was able to kind of put that into theater for a long time. And then a friend of mine who had sort of made this strain, this transition into documentary film kept kind of telling me, hey, I really, I really think you would like this kind of storytelling too. And so I started to dip, dip my toes in and, um, and then it kind of, it kind of took over. I would say it's what you do now. It's what it's I what, do now. It's what you're known for around, <laughs> around, around town, yeah. around this town. Um, and you win Emmys. Well, that, you know, and you just try to make solid films. That people was that for, for Homestretch? Yes, that was for Homestretch. Um, tell us a little bit about how that started, how you got involved. Um, Cause that was your biggest sort of um, budget, sort of your. Well, that was kind of a first, I wouldn't say it's, it's not really. Budget based. Budget necessarily. It's, you know, and that's a very interesting story of very committed women who are friends deciding that a story is important enough to kind of keep coming back to. Even though, you know, when we started, uh, when we started filming that, the intent was that we were going to follow homeless adolescents in the Chicago area, primarily um, Chicago public school students that don't didn't have any permanent housing. And we were going to follow them for one year and sort of get, you know, there doc, in documentaries, you're always kind of looking for bookends and constraints to help you manage what the story is, right? Because unlike narrative, real life doesn't really have like a clear ending point. So it's always a struggle of like, what's the beginning here? What's the end? Um, we ended up following several subjects for almost seven years, about six years of filming, and then, you know, close to seven years with editing and finishing, um, because it just, sort of takes a long time, you know, to find who are the characters that are really going to take us on a journey here. Uh, I was a co-producer on that film. You know, there's lots of ins and outs on that. There's two other uh, women on that film that took the role as main director producers. Part of that is because I also had to step away as I had some young children. And as we, as filming continued on for seven years in Chicago, as it is sometimes as women working, we have to kind of adjust and figure out what our best way in on a project is. Um, so that um, so that film really was a, there was a lot learned about when you work with subjects. It, homeless adolescents aren't kids, you can always pick up the phone and say, hey, can you show up at exactly one o'clock at this place to film? You are sort of beholden to the ups and downs of their lives in a really, concrete way and that was a that was a fascinating lesson to learn on that film that's a lot that is a lot <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot i can't i was just thinking like oh mike it's hard enough i mean uh, yeah. nobody's where you want them to be when you yeah. want them to be i mean you can spend you know we could you could spend two years following someone and you have a really close relationship and circumstances change for them and and they're gone and right. the cell phone number you had for them is gone and and that that story right. line is over, you know. You know, I I love documentaries just in general. I love the the art form of it. But um, how often does that happen when you when you get going on a documentary and and you kind of have an idea of what the story is that you want to tell, but in the end, it's not even close to the story that that you... happens every single time. Yeah, I figured. I'm sure Valerie yeah. worked, you know works on documentaries too. I mean, that that is the story of every documentary is you just start with a little seed, a little character that interests you in. Well, you just finished one that was similar. I, well, I the, actually, the well, I've done a lot of documentary work, but I can really relate to that story because I, for almost 20 years or so, I've worked with um, the lovely Mary Ellen Mark and Martin Bell on a documentary called Streetwise, which mm. was nominated for an Oscar back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And they are still in touch with those homeless children of Seattle who um, we did a revisiting film just two years ago that played um, in Brooklyn. And it's, it's amazing how, yeah, just even over the course of 20 years, I mean, obviously a lot of them died and it's, um, it's heart wrenching, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, 
they, they're really important stories. Well, and in a film like that, what ends up happening is the filmmaking process obviously becomes a big part of their life as well. And so there's, there's always a back and forth and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ethical questions that come up when you're dealing with sort of vulnerable populations about how you are going to involve yourself in their life. Like what's that line going to be? And that those questions come up over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, Katie, would you say that once you get going with it, how, how closely involved are you with the edit? once you've filmed the documentary. So, and the question I'm trying to get at is let's say hypothetically, you and Val were to work on a documentary together, which you will now, um, because I can't believe that you're only just meeting tonight. I think you are for the first time. Um, how often do you hand it over to an editor and then all of a sudden it, it sort of takes a whole different the story becomes changed. Well, this you, will, you know, sparks may fly. Editors and producer directors may have different takes right. on that. I mean, I think that um, I think that's like the beauty of a documentary is how close the relationship is uh, between editors and producer directors. Um, I feel like I feel like it's such a joy to bring what is sometimes you know 100, 200 hours of footage to another set of eyeballs. To be able to, you know, sit with another person and go through right. this stuff and talk about it and what speaks to you and, you know, what can we immediately trash? I mean, I don't know how, um, but I, you know, I feel like, you know, the magic happens in the edit room, really. I mean, yeah. you're taking such vast amount of stuff and trying to boil it down. And, you know, I know there are people that work sort of solo as, as directors and editors. I can't imagine not being able to have that relationship in order to kind of keep working, working that stuff out. Yeah. yeah and, the, and the thing about a documentary is if it doesn't become an unexpected surprise, it's usually not as successful, yeah. quite right. honestly. And having worked on Comedian, the Jerry Seinfeld um, documentary, which I was actually the sound editor, my boss edited it. But if I could tell you how very different from the concept and 600 hours of footage later that film became, which you can see on Netflix, Comedian. But um it is definitely a process and usually the smaller group, the better. Yeah. Um, well, we have a, a student guest with us tonight too, who is considering pursuing a, a future in filmmaking in some capacity. And so I think we should bring her on so she can hear some of the things we're saying. And, and uh, this is Charlotte Marchioli. Charlotte is an eighth grader uh, here at the North Shore Middle School. And she is an aspiring filmmaker. Uh, and I've seen some of her work recently. And that was actually what sparked the idea for tonight's episode, actually. Um, I thought it would be really cool if we could connect Charlotte with some filmmakers in our very own community who maybe she could reach out to um, uh, as mentors. And so Charlotte, welcome to Girls Rising's uh, Virtual Connect. Uh, Thank this, you. And this is Katie Tabor, documentarian, and Valerie Lasser, film editor, two really powerful women who are doing great things in film. So Charlotte, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started making films and what got you excited about it and maybe some of the things you wanna do. And and you can ask uh, Val and Katie any questions you'd like. Got it. So, Char, um, Char, Char mm -hmm. before, before you start, I do wanna tell you, you have quite a fan club in our comment section. Oh. Everyone oh, is, oh gosh. you've got lots of hearts coming, oh. lots of love, <laughs> lots of love on the comment stream. All right. Oh, so yeah. that's all. I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> so much pressure now. Thanks, Nini. Gosh. You got it. I'm here for you. Um, so, I mean, I think the first time, like I actually like made a movie, you know, it wasn't nothing serious, but um, I, as far as, you know, as far back as I can remember, maybe I was like eight. Um, I've been directing my little cousins and my friends in like iMovies. I think the, mm -hmm. the first movie I made was called Mystery Island and it was at my family reunion. And I I think back then it was more of just like something to do. And but until like, you know, we I had edited all these clips of my little cousins running around my uncle's house in Peconic, um and then I edited it together and my favorite part was we all sat in the living room and I played it for my entire family, which is like, we have a fairly big family, like for the reunion. 
and everyone watched and at the end everyone was clapping and they're like good job and you know I was like oh this is nice like I I loved that feeling of the praise and stuff and so like I got home and I continued to direct my friends and cousins and everyone in movies and I could go into the iMovie app and I have like probably 20 or more like little fun movies I've made so yeah that's so cool, Charlotte. I love it. Well, I, I agree. It's a really fun thing to do, um, piecing together, you know, coming up with ideas. And um, so what are you thinking are, uh, at North Shore Middle School? Have there been opportunities for you to take classes or study in any way, filmmaking or what have you done? I, they do a pretty good job. I, I think in sixth grade, I took actually a documentary filmmaking elective. They have electives in the middle school where you can choose. Um, for me, I think it was really only just recently that I like had seriously begun thinking of uh, acting. I've been getting into music lately and film like could actually like, oh, like I could actually do this. So I think I I haven't got like given myself many opportunities at school to do any art really. I mean, I was never into musical theater or anything, you know, other than a documentary filmmaking elective, but right. now, now from now on, I definitely will. Yeah, I mean, you're not, uh, it's not too late for you, I don't think. <laughs> I think yeah. that you've still got some time. Um, well, that's great. So Nini, why don't we um, bring uh, Katie and Val back in and maybe uh, we can connect these these individuals and, and y'all can have a conversation. Charlotte, do you have any questions maybe that you'd wanna ask yeah, of Val and I Katie? Have um, so I have a couple questions. Um, I have like three main questions. I'm gonna like mush together two of them. Um, from someone who takes criticism and negative comments very harshly in what I do, like what advice would you have to me and like dealing with failure, or criticism, or like what's your experience with that and how can I deal with that? Go for I'll, it, Val. I'll say for criticism, if you become an editor, there's no such thing as criticism other than constructive. You can't be destroyed. You can't have an edit destroyed because somebody comments on it after watching it because arguably they don't usually know what they're commenting on. They think something's not working with the picture when actually it's the sound that precedes it that's making it not work or the music track's not right or, um, and if, you, like, if you're looking into getting into um, directing or uh, being a DP, somebody who just shoots the, the footage or, you know, a cinematographer um, or a director, it's really important to understand that each process because every good director has a collaborative relationship with a good editor. And the irony is it, in, in the spirit of Girls Rising, editing is a very male dominated field. Um, but in the history of movie making, the most successful male directors and uh, acclaimed films were cut by women. It, it's just like um, Martin Scorsese has Thelma Schumacher. Um, even back to like uh, Cecil B. DeMille, he had uh, Annie Bauchens. I'm not, I have notes that I'm following here. <laughs> but um, Dee Dee Allen cut many, many films, even um, The Breakfast Club, which might be one you're familiar with. Right, yeah, I've seen as well as Bonnie and Clyde, which is historically a fantastic film. Um, and even Quentin Tarantino, Reservoir Dogs was cut by um, the late Sally Menke, who uh, he's, he's been quoted as saying that she was literally the only genuine collaborator he ever had on a creative project. You know, the, the relationship's important because you find very few people who can do it all. You always find a better, a better product when you mix a good, a good, a good bunch of creatives. Yeah, I would just you know piggyback on on what Val's saying, and um, you know, even though it's it's like it can feel like when you're making these projects you're making now, Charlotte, that it feels very, in it feels so individual, and that it's it, what's amazing now is that with the technology there is now, you kind of can do these smaller projects that are, you know, almost like doing a, a painting at home. They're just pure kind of expressions of what you want to get out, which is 
an awesome way to kind of hone your sensibility and hone ideas about what's interesting to you. But ultimately, like what Val's saying, like this really is a collaborative art form. So it's it's not even that anything is a criticism. It's this sense of if you surround yourself by people that you're excited about and and who you're excited about what they're going to bring to the table and how they're going to you know see your work and bounce off your work I mean, kind of like making music or being in a band then even though they responded to it in a way that you didn't expect i think you get to the point where you don't really see that as criticism you see it as like wow wow i i didn't that isn't the energy I sent into the world, but that's how it was received by this person. So what, is, what does that mean? And what kind of like interesting thing is in that m messiness, you know? Um, I, I will say that, you know, there are times that I've worked with people where it did feel like criticism after criticism. And, you know, those are people you're just probably not gonna choose to work with again, because essentially you're not sort of, having enough of a vibe on what kind of work you're trying to make that it's worth staying in that relationship. Yeah, and, and one little note to that, oh, oh. In, unless Nini's on, one little note to that is also, after, I mean, and I work, I work primarily with advertising agencies and large groups of creatives, and there really isn't, when you're working professionally and you're hired to cut something, so you're being asked to create something for someone, it's not, so much a passion project as when you're doing your own film or documentary, right? But when you're working with a group, I've found, you know, there's no point in really ever fighting um, criticism or a comment you think won't work. I generally always just feel, you know, you never know until you try it. That's what being in the edit room is all about. You just don't know how well something's gonna work until you try it and it could bomb. And you, then you know you tried everything because that's, ultimately what gets you the best, the best story. Um, I was going to ask Val, and um, I think this is something Shar and, and Katie that you can probably relate to or think about um, with me is, for example, when we reach out to Val, usually it's for to edit something for Girls Rising or for Antigone Rising, and we barely know what it is that we want. We know, well, we want a video that's going to be exciting and we want to say X, Y, and Z. But it's really the creativity that you bring that all of a sudden, so this was in relation to uh, constructive criticism because we um, we throw something at you and it's your, the creative edit is something. It's not just piecing together thoughts and ideas. It's you're really creating this whole narrative uh, for us, it's almost like you're you're coming into our brain and saying, "Okay, I know what you're trying to say, and here's how we say it visually." And I'm going to need a couple of extra things from you. And as soon as we start seeing you laying it out, is when we realize, "Oh, yes, of course, we need to give you something like this, and we'll give you something like that." So, um, my question for you, Val, is when you went into editing, were you always a very creative visual person? Um, you know, that you didn't create the film, you didn't maybe come up with a theme for the movie, but you bring so much of that creativity to your editing. Is that, how did you, how did you find yourself in the editor's chair? Well, visually I've, I've always been obsessed with photography and I grew up with it and even shooting, but I've, I've always considered myself a writer and I've done many projects where I've been handed hundreds of hours of footage and no script. So I'm expecting to get an editor's and a writing credit on projects like that because I am writing the story. Um, and you can relate, I'm sure, with documentary filmmaking. There often is not a script. There's an idea, there's a concept, and there may be a storyboard to some degree, but building that dialogue and creating that story and not sounding scripted is what makes a true documentary. You know, And usually the girls, the girls rise and stuff is, arguably documentary filmmaking because right. it's just fly on the wall. And um, I understand your story too. You have to understand totally. your client. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I just feel like Val, we're just so connected on so many levels that when it comes time for us to piece together something, we hand it to you and, and you just, you take it to the next level. Cause I know, you know what we're trying to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're but so yeah, good at it. You know where we're going. And then you send something back and we're like, Oh my God, 
that's even better than we thought. We better, you know, you, you, you make us better. So easy to sell. Mm, well, thank you. So the how 30 would, second and what, I didn't mean to cut you off Val. what, what I happened? Think, Oh, I think that was probably me. Val, you froze. <laughs> I understand the 30 second commercial. You know what I mean? Yes. So I, I, I know how to, shorter is always going to be better, especially when you're just pitching an idea. Yeah. Right. Um, so what is something that Charlotte can do or really anyone out there that um, maybe has time on their hands, a video camera and editing tools? Um, how can you, what can you do during this pandemic, you know, by during this quarantine Um to like, Shar, there, do you have any thoughts or ideas of something you want to capture or something you want to say during this time? Um, well, actually, a couple of weeks ago, um, I noticed some of my friends were feeling bummed about not having an eighth grade graduation, which is like, you know, sad. So I took a bunch of videos and uh, mostly just videos from the past three years they've been in middle school and I put them together with some music and just as like a little, you know, I guess farewell or tribute to our middle school lives because I feel like they deserve that. So that's one thing I've done. I also did a video for Katie's birthday. Um, yeah, my mom had me do that. Um, so I feel that's, like just taking Charlotte. That's the video where I, I discovered you. That's when you, were, <laughs> that's when you were discovered and you got this big break. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like any um, you know just taking any of the footage, lots of footage I have on my phone and making movies or slideshows or whatever is what I can do in my position. Yeah. And that's the passion right there. Because totally. why do I need to be doing a PSA for Cuomo's contest? I Because I'm passionate about cutting films. Right. Did you do and, one? Yes. Are you one, <laughs> did you make it to the finals? No. Oh, that's They got like over 600. I but know. Mine's very, mine's very well written. I I'm think. sure it is. That's why I, I'm surprised. I saw the other day during the uh, the I saw the five that were in the finals. I thought they were pretty good, but I want to see yours. We should post yours. I think the task was accomplished because the idea was to flood social media with 600 submissions. So, yeah. winner or not, I think everyone did a great job. Yeah, yeah, everyone's a winner. Um, <laughs> what I would say too, uh, Charlotte, the video that you created for Katie's birthday. Um, it was so well done. Like, it's not just like an eighth grade kid who's like figuring out iMovie and putting things together. Like you told a really beautiful story and, you so and you, it was, there was so much sensitivity to it. And it did make me think of Val because Val brings that to any project that she does when she edits something together. And Katie, I'm sure you agree, right? We're, we're, I mean, Katie, what did you, I mean? Tell me what it was like when you saw that piece that Charlotte put together. Oh, well, I mean, it's well, first of all, it was a total surprise. So I right. was, you know, you're in the middle of the pandemic and suddenly people that you love and care about are, are sending you this nice thing. So it's, right. it's, it's a little overwhelming. So, <laughs> and that, just to so, give the premise, it was Katie's birthday and Charlotte put together a, a short little documentary piece of all of Katie's friends from town, just sort of talking about how. They know Katie and and what tell uh, you can explain what the documentary. Yeah, was, I mean, she they um were able to get I, I can't remember exactly but eight or nine um short interviews that just you know friends recorded and and then they you know it was all a surprise so they had just pulled photos off of my Facebook feed and this and that and and we were all given a directive. What was our directive, Charlotte? She my mom wanted serious and you know like act like you're being interviewed for a documentary but that's what was so great is actually it was um it is because the tone was like <laughs> it was like a documentary about right. katie you know right. very right. <laughs> yeah, you and know. i have to see it yeah I was, it's yeah, so what good am i watching i can't so i mean you know what i thought was so lovely char is that you just knew to give people the time that they needed you knew to like wait for sweet moments to land and to yeah. wait for jokes to actually land. I think you have like a really <laughs> good sense of order, sort of like emotional build to order. And, and, you know, I've always noticed in all your stuff, you have a great sensibility with how to use music and when to change music, you know, and actually I showed it to the director of, of Siempre 
And right, he just he just started watching. He texted me right away. He's like the bird sounds over the black at the beginning. This I is agree. Very the, serious. I and totally awesome. agree. It was so well done. Yeah. Agreed. Thanks so much. So lots yeah. of little touches. You already have a sense a sense about, which is just great. You know. Val, you'll love it. You'll love it. We'll get it. We'll I get you a copy. It. We'll get yeah. you a copy of it. Yeah. You know, just to answer what you guys were talking about with like, what can you do now? I mean, um, like I love what. Val was saying about considering herself a writer. And I really think that that's true of almost anyone who's a filmmaker in some level, right? Because it's just, there's this core level of wanting to tell a story, even if it's a story that comes out in a 30 second portrait or whatever, there's always this storytelling sensibility that, you know, the more you can explore, and it doesn't have to mean that you sit down and write, but there's just a way in which like, I think in this day and age of lots of content on your phone, you can start to think like that content on your phone is related to filmmaking, where I think like, you know, the process of thinking about story and the process of thinking about, oh, I'm I'm a writer without necessarily having to be a writer, if that makes any sense. But just that that I am a storyteller and I'm gonna keep thinking like a storyteller, even if what I wanna tell is the tiniest little image-based story, if that makes sense. As well as rhythm. It, mm -hmm. It's also like writing music. I don't play an instrument, but it's all about timing and, and all about how the story is told, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I love that I have you guys all talking about this. It's making me excited. Like I want to go make a documentary now and edit it myself. You score it. I'll cut it. Yeah. You produce it. Well, I'm pointing to the wrong box. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> on me. Um, we got a team right here. That's all you need. Yeah. So and all, what I always say, just one other plug for like women centered work. And this, and if there's men on the feed, this isn't to dis disparage anyone. But I was thinking about this before we came on, just like how much I love making films with with women because there's a way in which the the process just always feels a little messier and more open and more collaborative and like there's more you know you talk about being able to take criticism i have found that when i'm in these really artistic spaces with women there's just so much freedom to fail and freedom to try new ideas and freedom to like really throw throw it all at the wall and figure out what the best best way at a story is and i think that's like those are you know i'm sure all of you guys would agree those are like just the best moments in life definitely <laughs> Whose dog? Val? Claim it. Claim your dog. I, I muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> claim your dog. Somebody needs to claim their dog. So, well, you need yes. to take it away. You no, Chris. No, you. No, no you. don't. Please. No, I can't. Yeah, I want I, you to. No, I you should. Possibly. That needs to be edited, Val. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that we do like to uh, try to touch upon in any of these virtual connects um, specifically is. Um, how you are all handling the curveball of this pandemic, uh, how it's um, either forced you into doing different things, doing what you did, you know, a lot of people are out of work because of it. I'm just curious how you are all um, handling it uh, specifically. So Val, I know you've, you've, you're, you've like catapulted yourself into pioneer times and now you're like up in New Hampshire in a, I wouldn't say a shack, but hiding in the woods, <laughs> like yeah, only you can. The dogs are barking at a moose yeah. that keeps coming through the yard. But yeah, yeah. I'm up here working full <laughs> exactly. time. Um, homeschooling my two kids, taking a course at Yale, finishing up with my interns. Uh, yeah. I tend to always put too much on my plate. When I have nothing to do is when I panic, yeah. like actors, really. <laughs> when an editor no, has nothing to do is when they're... Uh -oh. So Which in part? other words, though, work, you still have work. Yeah, I've been working. Yeah, no, nonstop. Nothing's changed. Okay, that's good. Um, uh, what are you working on? Can you tell us anything exciting? Oh, a lot of Zoom and privately shot footage because they can't shoot. Right. Um, as well as a lot of jobs that had pre-existing footage that we're yeah. just um, recycling. Um, but a lot of nice, interesting stories. Everything seems to be a bit COVID related and yeah. uh, trying to avoid using the same track you hear on every single spot that you yeah. see on TV, the sad ambient piano. 
Um, but you know, aside from uh, sad ambient pianos, one other thing I'm noticing a, a theme of is in every single news broadcast, um, people feel the need to show their bookshelves. <laughs> I mean, well, just, you have had your bookshelf in your feet. Because I'm in Sarah's. This is like Sarah's <laughs> face. Like, and so. Look at my books. Books. These are my, this is what I read. I read I'm, I'm, I'm reading fourth grade English and uh, and, ten, and 10th grade English because I'm yeah. homeschooling. So I have to stay on top of that at night. So I'm ahead of the lesson so that I can be a classmate to my kids. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing in fifth grade. Um, anyway, what I was going to say too is um, quickly, uh, you will soon be uh, reviewing some notes from a little thing that you've been editing together for us that we have been meaning to give you notes on. Yeah. We're so bad. Sometimes we really go dark, don't we? I have it right here. I've been waiting. Um, oh, good, good. All right, good. So um, we are working on notes for that. Nini, go ahead. So, yeah, actually, I'm, uh, Shar Shar, do you have another question mm -hmm. for us here? Right. I just have one more. Yeah. Um, so um, recently um, being at home has made me like, think about what I want to do when I'm older and I've kind of um focused on the arts like I'm getting into music like I said uh, maybe acting or directing obviously but my question would be just how do I get myself out there now because I think better off to start earlier than later so you know how would I as an eighth ninth grader get myself out there now hmm well, I mean, there's hundreds of film festivals all over the internet on a, on a global level all the time. You can research those and submit, submit, submit. It doesn't matter how old you are. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think um, I, I agree with, you know, what you're saying is interesting. Like, is it, is younger better? I mean, I think follow the speed of your passion, you know, like there's no pressure to do something earlier rather than later. Like you're just building your whole life mm -hmm. right like you're building the way you think about things and the way you see things and so you know i would i'd caution you against thinking like oh you have to like put the you know pressure on yourself but i think it's like just keep making stuff and just keep thinking and keep reading and like watch things watch things that are good i guess i'm sure val would agree with that like you know it's, yeah. it's fine to once in a while watch something you know is bad but it's really good to remind yourself I should watch things that like, I think, wow, this is well made. This is a good story. This is well edited with this is great music. And just like notice for yourself, why do you think it's great? Like that's, you know, I think that's and important. On the other side of that, there's no movie not worth watching yeah. just for the sake of why it may not work. Yeah. It, you have a lot to watch yeah. between now and 20. Right. <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to supply you a list of books and oh, definitely. that are yeah. crucial. And you can start just by Googling female directors and female editors, and you'll find quite an impressive list of Oscar nominated and winners. Um, I think the first uh, female nominated director was uh, Bigelow, Catherine Bigelow for The Hurt Locker. I don't even know if you're old enough right. to have watched The Hurt Locker yet. <laughs> no. It's a fantastic movie. And she was the first Absolutely. Oscar not, uh, winner uh, who was a female who directed it. And I think to keep asking yourself, I mean, every time you read something or watch something like, you know, what did I think of it and why did I think that? I mean, to, to move to the, to keep moving forward, it's, it's really about your critical thinking skills in terms of like, what about that worked? What about it didn't work? What what spoke to me and what what didn't? You know. Right. Someone call on me. Nini. Nini. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank goodness. Um. So you know, Charlotte. Um, I think this is applicable to music as well in the way that when you want to get started, there's that drive inside of you to get started and do. So you start making your movies on iMovie or whatever it is, but. Um, you know, there was a period in my life where I really wanted to get involved in writing music for film and television. And my wife, who is in that industry, said the smartest thing. And she says it over and over to all of her writers, which is if you want to write for film and TV, watch film and TV critically and listen for what is being shown. You can't just sit in your studio and say, well, I really want to write what I feel. I want to write all these uh, songs that go like this. 
And then you can do all of that, spend all your time. But if what you're trying to do is very specific, if you're trying to make a particular kind of movie or you're trying to get a particular feeling out of something, who is doing that? And then you start paying attention. Is there a specific tempo? Is there a, for film, is it a specific lighting? Um, and that for me was the greatest lesson. It was don't fast forward the commercials if you wanna get into commercials. You watch them and you pay attention. Um, and that goes, I think, across the board for, for any industry, especially if there's not a lot of uh, people that look like you in that industry. So if there's not a lot of women in, the, in that industry or whatever it is, if there's not a lot of diversity, it's what, is, what are they doing so that I can model and, be, and do it with my own voice? Um, that, that would be my, my take on that. Um, Kristen. Very true. Super true. Oh, do you want to bring me back in? I Am I back in? I'm watching on Facebook right now. Oh. <laughs> um, well, ladies, we are 47 minutes in, and I yeah, think we haven't been shut down. No one has had uh, an emergency. Uh, I think I think we have we it. done we what we needed I to wanna, do here. Can I give Charlotte one, one piece of advice? Because it's also for anyone who might be listening. Of course. Yes. As far as editing, and I don't care what you like or don't like about a certain app or whatever, you need to know them all, iMovie, Adobe Premiere, and Avid. So you can get student discounts on all of them. You can actually get Avid for free on their website, avid.com, and you can get uh, Media Composer first. Similar to iMovie, but that's actually where film editing all started. Avid is the fundamental aspects of all things film editing. But you should know all of them because they're always just changing. And um, getting into college, you never know what system they're going to have there. but. Right. That's, yeah. my, that's something you can start doing right now. And content, right? Content is you build and you build and you build. And with every movie, you get better. With every with every cut, you get better. Um, I think it's just practice. I, uh, you just build your, you build your catalog. And when you look from the first to the middle to the end, you'll see growth. Oh. <laughs> I tried to pull everybody back on the stream and I think I almost deleted everyone. We're doing great. We're, okay, very good. You know, I was great. um I was going to say too, it's good to know, Charlotte, uh, that you have this interest because we have opportunities on the constant and are always looking for someone who is like around town and and excited to film and do things uh, with the band. Nini, wouldn't you agree? So it's good to know. That we've got you, Charlotte. I would definitely agree. In fact, yeah. in fact, um, it's so a good she, thing she's not in school right now because you're about to get very busy. You are about to get busy. <laughs> You'll be directing and handing it off to Val in no time to edit it together. And Katie will <laughs> watch we, it to give only positive, uh, <laughs> positive reaction. Really? So, yeah. I, so Nini, how do we want to wrap this one up tonight? I think we just say thank you. Um, take a minute, thank all of our guests, and um, yeah. and then we'll wrap it up. So let's um, also thank Branch Real Estate for sponsoring us. Absolutely, the fine Branch. People at Branch. Yeah, Branch. You know, it's interesting. Branch uh, has been with us for quite a while, and even even through this crazy time, um, they are still saying we want to we want to be involved. We want to, we want to participate. We want to do what we can to help you. And, and, um, that really says something. So it does. Well, they are a women run business and, uh, you know, that's the most important thing is sticking together. Ladies. Can so, I give one plug for my uh, film coming up? Absolutely. I'll, get, uh, I'll totally get in trouble if I don't plug. <laughs> so the, um, the most recent film I produced is premiering on HBO on October 6th. What so is it called? Siempre Luis. And it is a documentary about a really inspiring American who came from Puerto Rico in the 70s with, you know, nothing but his his creative mind. And he became a um, political uh, a community organizer first and then sort of a political activist and operative that went on to run campaigns for Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton. And he is also Lin-Manuel Miranda's father, the creator of Hamilton. So the story follows um, follows both Luis and Lin-Manuel as they go back to Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria to bring a production of Hamilton down there. And sort of in that storytelling, tells the biography of Luis and also talks about how Luis is really a big inspiration for the character of Alexander Hamilton as well. Wow. So check well, I it remember, out. I, I'm, October I, 6th. 
Yeah, I remember I remember when they started doing that um, in Puerto Rico, when there mm -hmm. was all the talk about it and the preparations yep. for it. So it's Siempre Luis yep. in, on HBO, you said? HBO, October oh, 6th. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, October, yeah, October 6th. Great. That's we're super exciting. Yep. We're so proud of you, Katie. That's really a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. We're excited to get it, to get it out, out to the world. He's a really inspiring character. And I think it's a really wonderful time to hear his story. Right on. So cool. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, one last plug, Nini, I think we should just say it. If you can, please, please. do give to Girls Rising, consider a donation. Uh, you can go to girlsrising.org slash donate. It helps us keep continuing to do the work we're doing. And, uh, and we're so grateful for any, anything you can give. So we want to thank Katie. We want to thank Val. We want to thank Charlotte. I think we, thank we you had guys a, so much. I think we had a really good mm -hmm. night. We yeah. did all right. I think That's we should great. do it again. I think we'll be here next Thursday, actually, uh, at seven o'clock. And I hope to uh, hope to see everybody there. Right Thanks, on. ladies. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Thanks you guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.